It's innovation of a novel blood conservation technique. Um, the lead perfusionist at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Clara, California. I want to give acknowledgement to our, our hospital systems analyst, Min Chu Tren. She is our SDS data person, for lack of a better word. She helped me do the data mining and helped with graph design. I have no financial interest in any manufacturers. I'm not a statistician. This is an informal retrospective review. Here's Santa Clara, home of the new Levi Stadium, where we'll have the Super Bowl next year. This is a picture of our hospital. A little background about our, my hospital. It's a newer cardiac program, about six years old, adults only, 750 cases. Four, four perfusionists, four surgeons, four anesthesiologists. We ge we're geared mostly for minimally invasive type of cases, many AVRs, port access, MVRs. And according to our cannula vendors, we are the third largest user of femoral cannula in the, in the states. We participate in the STS, and we have regional benchmarking with our sister hospitals. Why we do it? Well, it's not easy. We do it to optimize our care, make, to make sure we're making relevant choices and making a difference. <clears throat> Background support is STS membership, morbidity and mortality meetings, blood utilization, conservation committees, and it's, our SDS is used for budget planning. <clears throat> our attitude regarding blood conservation, negotiating whenever feasible, hallways, etc., discussion at M&Ms, scientific mother, merit. We're discussing it in the prescript, surgical timeout, making conversations post, we're making a conversation with the post-intubation blood gas. What is our blood conservation plan today? Consistent and sustained determination. A just do it attitude. A little bit of, of our evolution. Biocompatible circuits, small cannula, vacuum, shorter lines, three eight inch venous lines, mini circuit for all, HMS, wrap, yet we still had higher than average transfusion rates, about 62%. Um, so I'm quite, a big part of our talk, my talk today is, um, is based off of the 2011 SDS recommendations. I'm gonna briefly go through the ones that pertain to perfusion. I know you've all seen this before, and these are the definitions, but I'm gonna summarize them under each as item. Perfusion interventions, microplegia. It's less well established by non-random trials. Mini circuits, it's the highest recommendation. To reduce hemodilution, indicated for blood conservation, especially in patients at high risk for adverse effects of hemodilution. We do participate in blood prescriptive perfusion. Thanks to the electronic medical record, we're able to, to review the patient's history, height and weight, um, surgeon, type of procedure, and de determine which circuit to use. Now, we have a mini circuit and a, I call it a mini me circuit. Um, FX15 with the smaller venous reservoir or the FX25 with the standard reservoir. We do use vacuum. It is less well established. We use biocompatible circuits. It is less well established. We do use a hard shell reservoir. It's less well established. 
There was no mention of closed venous reservoir or bag technology. Centrifugal pumps, less well established. In patients requiring longer bypass times, um, using higher or patient specific heparin concentrations may be considered. This is less well established. Protamine tit titration or empirically low regimens is less well established. Um, low dose heparinization, less well established. Acute normovolemic may be considered for blood conservation, but its usefulness is not well established. It could be used as part of a multi-pronged approach to blood conservation. This is less well established. Of course, we all do it, right? Retrograde autologous priming may be considered. This is less well established. We all do this. Sequestration. Now, this is my definition. Withdrawal of heparinized arterial whole blood for later reinfusion is found to be a viable blood conservation measure. It's not retrograde autologous priming or acute normal volemic hemodilution. Okay, so I'm, now I'm going to get to the video. Okay, so we're cannulated arterial and venous. You can see the blood coming down. Not going into the oxygenator. It's going up the research line. I'm clamping the line that goes into the reservoir. I'm opening up my bag. I'm translocating volume. Surgeon keeps asking me or telling me I can go and bypass when I'm ready. We, but we're communicating how much I have, what my goal is. My goal is a leader. <clears throat> See the pressure 122 over 50. And our anesthesia providers help us out, giving little doses of Neo to help bump up the pressure periodically. This case is a hemi arch. I'm halfway there. I'm halfway there. We have a little bit more bump. Thank you. I'm asking the anesthesia for a little bit more of a bump. I think this is amazing that everybody's patient and lets us do this. 
You guys are patient too. A leader. <clears throat> yeah, let's. We. It's um. Yeah, we've tried that. But we want to Okay, so now I've finished. I'm ready to go on at any time. I'm ready to go on at any time. Okay. So now let me get back to my PowerPoint. Yes. You do. Do you go on with a driving as long? Yeah. So you don't ready, basically. Okay. So I need to get back to. Okay, here's, I don't know if you guys can really see, um, this is three and a half hours sitting. We don't agitate the bag at all during the case. Of course, this is the, the blood-tinged bag of LR. Um, red cells factors up here. Now, if we need volume during the case, if we need red cells during the case, we will drop it in. But we'll not drop this in until the end or we'll clamp it and hand it to anesthesia. <clears throat> Evolution of this, we're utilizing the smallness of our mini circuit the flexibility of our circuit to shuttle arterial blood into a bag, bypassing the cone and the oxygenator, we have more volume than we need in the reservoir. Our anesthesia colleagues report strong anecdotal experiences uh, with hemostasis and comparing the coagulation, the, the coags, doing this or not doing this. So we have a lot of surgeon and anesthesia buy-in. So in 2013, our transfusion rate, intra-op, is sick, almost 62%. And this year, 34%. So roughly half. And this is from our SDS database. Here's a breakdown of the different blood products. So here's the rest. This is the actual number of units of 2013 of red cells. So you can see it's about half. Here's the breakdown, FFP. It's consistently about half of what, what we've been doing. Here's an annualized cost savings. This is, and the this is based on <clears throat> what the hospital pays for each component. This doesn't take into, into account personnel cost, etc. So this is so what I did was I calculated how much we used in 2013 versus 2014, and this is what we came up with. So you can see this is a, a very convincing. Returning this blood to the patient. We follow the AAB guidelines and return it to the patient within four hours of harvest. Based on anesthesia, anesthesiologist's preference, we'll give the whole bag to anesthesia or we'll drop half of it in um, into the bypass machine right before we're about to terminate. 
or we'll drop the whole bag prior to terminating. So, of course, you must have a good idea of how much volume you need in order to come off and how much anesthesia is willing to wait to put all the volume back in the patient. It's a coordinated effort. Sometimes the surgeon may be willing to come off skinny if there's not, not a whole lot of volume in the circuit draining the venous. We do, so we do chase the entire circuit into the patient as best we can. We do not send it to the cell saver. We reverse anesthesia. We we'll reverse the heparin with one-to-one -one protamine up the dose that they gave in order to heparinize. The advantages of this is to have a net 400 to 500 cc prime. It's performed when arterial and venous are cannulated, so you have the safety factor. It's a controlled sequestration between perfusion and anesthesia in a short period of time. And we're able to withdraw an average of a, a liter into an empty IV bag. There's no exposure to the oxygenator, so the less contact activation. The volume is readily accessible for immediate administration. When not needed for a volume, we allow it for settling so that we will only be giving the red coat. And the volume above the red coat will be given by anesthesia or by perfusion immediately before termination. The blood is arterial, so it's oxygenated. The red blood cells have a longer viability while sequestered. And the volume that anesthesia gives pre-bypass is not restricted. The coagulation profile demonstrates higher fibrinogen and platelet counts. The pitfalls of this. We cannot do this if the surgeon is pushing in the heart. That makes it difficult, or if the patient is unstable. If the patient is less than 60 kilos or anemic, or if we, if we do sequestration but end up going back on bypass, we return the blood back to the patient but end up going back on bypass. It could be a little bit of a waste, but all in all, um, it's still a good thing. Management of blood resources. Back to the recommendations. Creation of a multidisciplinary blood management teams is a reasonable means of limiting blood transfusion and decreasing perioperative bleeding while maintaining safe outcomes. In other words, do what works for your institution and do work with what you can. That's my references. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>